Good evening, everyone. My name is Donna Walker Kuhn. I'm Senior Advisor, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at New Jersey Performing Arts Center. And welcome to our PSENG True Diversity Film Series. The theme for our panel tonight is immigration, enforcement, detention, and advocacy. And we will discuss this country's treatment of our new arrivals as well. This evening's panel was curated in association with ACLU Newark, New Jersey, and we are deeply appreciative for their guidance and support. I also hope you were able to enjoy the film, Colonization is Extinction, about the economic crisis in Puerto Rico. The social justice series is part of our Standing and Solidarity Initiative. The purpose of this series is to bring our community together and to encourage everyone to take part in the movement to ensure civil rights for all. On our website, you will find archived prior social justice panel discussions, as well as resources that will help you take action. We're also very happy to have as our advisors, Newark NAACP, New Jersey Institute for Social Justice, Newark Arts, and the Truth Racial Healing and Transformation Center at Rutgers University, Newark and also the, the Africana Institute at Essex County College. Now, we would like to offer a land acknowledgement. The language we're using is created with consultation and guidance from Chief Dwayne Perry of the Rampopo Lenape Munsee Tribe and Oleana Whispering Dove of the Eastern Salagi Algonquin descendant. And we're grateful to them for their generosity, wisdom, and labor to craft these words. We, the Lenape, original benefactors of land once ripened and cultivated with attentiveness to the creator and her ascendancy, express everlasting gratitude to our creator for the traditional ancestral jurisdictions of the Muncie, Asopus, Canarsi, Capsi, Wurpos, Silinoi, and Wikisquik, jointly known today as the Rampopo and Nanticote Leni Lenape. We are the Lenape Hoki today and will be for the remaining days of tomorrow, keepers of the past. Let this moment of recognition be a monument of action. Let it be the beginning of hope for this, our eternal island, and for the Rampopo Lenape, the Muncie people of whose land we now trod. Here on this land, in the place of the Muncie, we acknowledge our debt to those who have come before us, to those who've been denigrated and suffered for the sake of cultural and land appropriation. Let this, our land acknowledgement, be the beginning of our return to unity. Let us be guardians of the water, the air, the earth, the four-legged, the flyers, the swimmers, the crawlers, the mammal people and the green. Let us now stand lifting our humanity and rapturing with earth's consciousness as guardians of harmony and kindness. This acknowledgement demonstrates our ongoing commitment as a community working to dismantle the continued legacies of colonialism, oppression, and systemic racism. We offer a pledge of social justice awakening and education in order to raise the level of awareness and to ultimately strengthen the communal fabric, which includes engagement with our indigenous neighbors. So thank you so much. I would now like to introduce our PSEG representative, Sandra Heno, Heno, Principal Consultant for Corporate Finance. And we are so appreciative for PSEG supporting our social justice series for many years and delighted to have you with us this evening, Sandra. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. Welcome everyone to tonight's event. I'm Sandra Heno, Principal Consultant in Corporate Finance at PSEG. We are the very proud sponsors of the PSEG Through Diversity Film Series. Our company, Public Service, and the PSEG Foundation are pleased to be longtime partners with the New Jersey Performing Arts Center. PSEG was among the earlier supporters of the NJPAC, and the Through Diversity Film Series represents the best of that relationship. In fact, we have continued our support and earlier this year, the PSEG Foundation announced a two-year pledge to the NJPAC for the Standing and Solidarity Program, which includes the True Diversity Film Series. 
this film series is a reflection of PSEG's commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion, especially here in Newark, where we are more than just another utility and more just than another company. PSEG has made our headquarters in this community for well over a century. We marked our 118 year anniversary earlier this year. We are proud of our commitment as citizens of Newark and as citizens of New Jersey. A tremendous part of that commitment is our support for organizations such as NJPAC and what that support means for diversity, for education, and for the arts. One year ago, in the wake of the tragic murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis and the demonstrations that follow in cities and communities around the country, PSCG and the PSCG Foundation announced another commitment, the Powering Equity and Social Justice Initiative. The initiative is the PSCG Foundation's $1 million commitment to support organizations that address the racial injustice, inequality, and human rights in communities of color in New Jersey, New York, and anywhere PSCG operates. In order to continue to emphasize the importance of providing support in such areas of critical community need, the PSEG Foundation has realigned its giving strategy under the three new pillars, environmental sustainability, equity and economic empowerment, and social justice. When one of us is impacted in our community, we all feel the impact. That's why it is essential that we all join together to act and build a framework of equity, compassion, and respect throughout the many diverse communities we represent that will truly benefit us all. On behalf of PSEG, we believe that our longstanding support for diversity, education, and the arts help us contribute to that idea as well. Now, it is my honor to welcome all of you to this important and timely event on immigration and foreman's detention advocacy. Thank you for being here this evening and please enjoy the discussion. And with that, I'll pass it back to Donna who will introduce you to our moderator. Thank you so much. Thank you. So we are delighted to have Jason Hernandez as our moderator this evening. Jason comes to us from Rutgers Law School. Uh, where he started as an immigrant rights attorney, uh, creating the Rutgers Immigrant Community Assistance Project, uh, which is a campus-based legal service uh, initiative. Um, he's involved in individual representation to the students and provides community immigration and know your rights presentations throughout New Jersey. Please welcome Jason Hernandez. Thank you, Jason. Good evening all, it is my great pleasure to join you all this evening and to moderate this um, event with my esteemed panelists. Um, it is my pleasure to start by introducing the four panelists that will be joining us this evening. Um, first, I would like to introduce uh, Walter Walterio Alomar. He is the director, writer and producer of the award-winning documentary, Colonization is Extinction and serves as the president of Ocho and he will introduce himself briefly. Thank you, Jason. Uh, thank you, everyone. And uh, thank you for having me. Uh, yes, uh, my organization, um, we are a nonprofit organization that provides cultural, educational, and mental health services to the community. Uh, we've created several programs throughout New York, New Jersey, uh, and several areas around the, uh, around the states uh, regarding mental health programs and treatment programs. And my organization is also an NGO with the United Nations. Mm -hmm. So we are uh, we attend sessions at the United Nations regarding issues that pertain uh, to surrounding countries, uh, Latin America, and, and so on. And, and we're able to uh, to basically put in our two cents and to take part in, in what's happening in these uh, world issues. Thank you, Walter. Um, second, I would like to introduce Yemi Gámez Castillo. She is a multidisciplinary queer immigrant artist born in Honduras and raised and based in Newark, New Jersey. She's a singer, songwriter, music producer, event curator, and multifaceted creative with activist roots as a community organizer. Welcome, Yemi. 
Thank you so much for having me, everyone. Good evening. Um, that was pretty much my intro. I'm Yami. It's an honor to be here. I am co-founder of Invisible, which I will talk a little bit more about. Uh, we're a collective that curates safe spaces and utilize art, advocacy, and education to amplify the voices of the undocumented and immigrant intersectional community. Uh, and for me, activism has really just been a necessity. And I came into this world because I wanted to see spaces where people with my experiences and my identities could all come together and build solidarity and use storytelling to bridge uh, the spaces that have been underrepresented and underheard. Thank you, Yemi. Uh, next, it is my great pleasure to introduce Amal Sima, Sina, who is the executive director of ACLU New Jersey. Um, as a leading nationally recognized lawyer and policy expert, Amal is a frequent commenter on civil rights, immigrant rights, criminal justice, racial justice, and issues affecting Amer um, Asian American and South Asian American communities. Welcome, Amal. Thanks so much, Jason. It's it's good to be here. Uh, great thanks to NJPAC and PSCNG for hosting us. Um, you know, the ACLU is a nationwide organization, and in New Jersey, we've been around for over sixty years. and And our work is uh, one of integrated advocacy, where we use all of our tools, including litigation, uh, legislative advocacy, uh, organizing, and uh, public education to. Uh, try to achieve our policy goals, one of which is to make sure that immigrants in our communities feel uh, welcome and are welcome and, and safe, uh, and that New Jersey strives to be as fair and welcoming of a state as it possibly can be. Great, thank you. And last, but certainly not least, it is my pleasure to introduce Erica Martinez, who is an organizer at Make the Road New Jersey, a community organization that builds the power of immigrant and working class communities in New Jersey to achieve dignity and justice. Welcome, Erica. Thank you, Jason, for the introduction. I'm so happy to be here um, with all my fellow panelists. Um, so again, my name is Erica. Um, I'm a youth organizer at Make the Road New Jersey, um, and I'm also a senior at Rutgers um, University in Newark, um, majoring um, in sociology and minoring in legal studies. Um, so um, Jason started saying it, right? Make the Road New Jersey is an immigrant and workers' rights organization, um, and our mission is um, simple, but I think super powerful. Um, it's to achieve respect and dignity for immigrant and working class communities. Um, and we do that through community organizing, right? Shifting power back to our communities. We do that through legal services, policy innovation, um, and transformative education, right? Working one-on-one -on -one with the communities um, that are fighting back um, to achieve respect and dignity. Um, and I'm, I'll talk more about what that work looks like later on. Um, but again, thank you to everybody for being here tonight um, and joining us in this conversation. Thank you, Erica. And before I circle back to Walter with my first question, I do just wanna take a minute or two to try and frame this conversation since immigration is such a broad intersectional topic, we could sit here for probably days and discuss a variety of issues that not only affect New Jersey, but the greater United States. Um, but briefly, I'll just say that immigration is an incredibly broad issue that intersects with countless aspects of the human experience. Um, today, we endeavor to contemplate the role of immigration both as a consequence and as an opportunity. A consequence of American international relations that have left a tangible impact, um, sometimes harmful, on the political, economic, and cultural systems around the globe, even today, the legacy of American intervention um, impacts uh, you know, immigration to the United States. Um, on the other hand, immigration is an opportunity for the United States to recognize its own role in the increased migration of individuals fleeing desperate con conditions for a chance at a better, if not decent life, um, an opportunity to do better, an opportunity to take a reformative action and recognize that no person is illegal only acts can be illegal, right? Um, further, during this discussion, I challenge the audience um, to consider this question. Does the fact that an action violates a law make that act wrong? Or has the national dialogue often missed the point? Before I, before I again circle back to Walter, I'll just remind everybody here tonight um, that in this very nation that we talk so highly of freedoms and our Declaration of Independence, slavery was legal. Um, blanket exclusion from the United States on the basis of Asian origin was legal. 
internment of US citizens, right? US citizens of Japanese origin was legal. Segregation was legal. And discrimination on the basis of a variety of diverse factors was legal and in some ways, you know, was poorly protected um, even today. Um, so I just plant that seed in the back of your mind as we often, you know, hear the refrain, you know, but immigrants broke the law. And I think we all have to consider, you know, maybe the law itself is broken. Um, and so with that, um, I will turn to Walter um, and his documentary, right? Um, Colonialism is extinction. But first, I just want to acknowledge that Puerto Rico is somewhat similarly differentiated, uh, differ, uh, somewhat similar, somewhat differently situated than um, countries in Central and South America in that um, residents of Puerto Rico are citizens of the United States. So I just want to acknowledge that, um, but it does not change sort of what we are going to speak about. And Walter, in my opening, I said that international relations um, impacted uh, far reaches of the globe, um, but colonialism as extinction highlights the US relationship with Puerto Rico as a form of colonization. Um, would you, and I guess sort of under this guise of a commonwealth, would you please elaborate on that point and the fundamental ways that the U.S. has changed the economy, culture, and politics of the island, possibly forever? Well, um, as, as you can see from the film, um, which I'm sure you, everyone saw, um, the, the, what happened in Puerto Rico when the United States first invaded Puerto Rico, because that's what they actually did, they invaded the island. And one of the things that they did was they reduced the Puerto Rican peso uh, by 40%. So by doing so, they basically slashed the economy of the island in half. And, and by doing so, they were able to acquire much more property throughout the island because the, of the reduction of the, of the uh, per people's personal wealth. So in doing so, um, they were able to basically to take advantage of the people. Then, then they also, in 1899, there was a major hurricane, just kind of like Hurricane Maria, that basically wiped out um, thousands of, of Puerto Ricans uh, as well. And then they instituted a bit of a property tax. So there were these three beginning factors when the United States first invaded that basically put Puerto Rico in the red. And it became, we basically became property of the United States because at that, from, from that very uh, moment, um, we had to basically borrow money, so to speak, from the U.S. government in order to rebuild our infrastructure, to rebuild the land, to rebuild the roads, and and so on. So right away, we right from the very beginning, we started in the red, and we've never gotten out of the red. We we've always been there. And then they, of course, um, like you mentioned a little while earlier, that uh, you know Puerto Rico, we are you know Puerto Ricans are United States citizens, but we also all have the the issues that that the uh, that that the immigrants have by migrating uh, or, or coming to Puerto, or coming to the United States because of the conditions of the island, even way back then, even until this very day. So, um, you know, history kind of just has a tendency to repeat itself. It, it doesn't, uh, you know, there's nothing new under the sun. You know, we're still property of the United States. Uh, they can actually sell off the island if they wanted to. Uh, so we're, we're in a really dark state and a lot of people are unaware, unaware of it. And that's that's one of the reasons why, um, you know, I made this film to kind of push this information out there. Do you have any thoughts on sort of, I guess, the U.S. sense of accountability um, based on the fact that individuals from Puerto Rico can travel to the United States? Has that made it so that the mainland's government has not had a great compulsion to address issues? As your documentary points out, I mean, Vieques has been toxified, right? I mean, this is yes. well covered. I mean, the land has been in great, great ways destroyed. Um, also, yes. the, the government has been, you know, completely mm -hmm. sort of, uh, you know, there, there was an interesting discussion on sort of the military governorship of Puerto right. Rico for the first half of the 20th century. And I wonder if you could just speak a little bit about uh, sort of this relationship between the answer being leaving the island and divesting it of its cultural identity and its people versus restoring the island, right? Well, from, from what I gather, from what uh, my, my colleagues gather, they, uh, from what it seems like, they just want to push the people of Puerto Rico out of Puerto Rico. That's, that's basically, they're, they're creating unlivable conditions in the island. Um, from, from right from you saw from uh, the island of Vieques, 
highly contaminated. Over 90% of the population has, you know, uranium, aluminum, and so on contamination um, throughout the land and throughout the people. And um, they've been the the Navy, the Marines, they left uh, back in, uh, I believe it was 2007 or 2008, and they have yet to clean up less than uh, 15% of the island. They've only, clean, they've only managed to clean up 15% of the island. And they've spent over $150 million. Where is all this money going? What is the issue? You know, um, I, I took a trip to Vieques uh, two years ago, and I actually met with the Navy and, and with, uh, with, with the Army Corps of Engineers and, and some of the government uh, officials out there, because there's actually meetings that people can attend on the island of Vieques with with those uh, with those officials to discuss the cleanup of the island, and it's just kind of a a well they want to decide how to clean the island how they see fit. If you have an idea, we may listen to your idea, but you know it, it doesn't necessarily mean that that we're going to follow it. And that's that's been the case since the very beginning. From 1898, they they've created unlivable conditions. You know, it was illegal to fly the flag in Puerto Rico. It was illegal to speak Spanish in school. It was illegal to sing songs about independence. You know, citizenship was imposed upon the people of Puerto Rico. We didn't ask to be citizens. They made us citizens. If you rejected it, you were thrown in jail. So right from the very start, it was just undesirable, unlivable conditions that were being instituted to the people of Puerto Rico. And that's when we started to have the mass migrations, like in the 50s and so on, because they actually used to run commercials in Puerto Rico, come to the United States. You know, there's plenty of jobs and so on here. And and we've kind of been following suit. But when we came here, you know, we wound up in the slums of the Bronx and so on. And, and you know, it wasn't the paradise that uh, that they declared it to be. So again, it's just the same cycle. And, and you know, we honestly believe that they're just trying to cr- maintaining those current conditions. They want the people of Puerto Rico out of the island and they just want to, you know, take it over and turn it into something else. Thank you. So I just sort of want to now give you an opportunity. So in this, in the documentary, I think the documentary begins to wrestle a little bit with some possible solutions, sort of alluding to statehood versus independence versus right. something in between a discussion, right? There's a clip of uh-huh. um, Representative Gutierrez talking about um, a, just having at least, at the very least, a discussion in you know the highest, you know, one of the most um, you know, quintessential democratic governments in the world, we can't even have a conversation, a democratic conversation about the fate of Puerto Rico. Um, right. What do you see as possible solutions um, that could begin to address some of these issues, obviously recognizing that they are very large issues, right? Mm-hmm. That have been built, that have been centuries in the making. Right. Well, I believe in independence. I believe in freedom. And one of the one of the issues that are, that weighs heavily on the on the island is that because we are property of the United States, we are unable to receive aid or assistance from neighboring nations. So, for example, when the hurricane hit the island, you know, Cuba couldn't help us. Other nations could help us. If we were free, if we were a free nation, we we, we would be able to do business with other neighboring nations. Eighty five percent of what's consumed in Puerto Rico has to be imported. And that's a major uh, tax, the, the, the Jones bill, which cost you know, Puerto Rico $500, $500 million annually. If we were a free nation, we wouldn't be subject to that. And we'd be able to do trade with, you know, with uh, nations in, in Europe and, and, and Japan and China and Russia. And we would be able to, to uh, operate uh, on, on a trade level. So our hands are really tied because we're not in a position where we can do anything because we are a colony or property of the United States. And the United States, they also preach freedom and democracy all over the world. I mean, this is why they start wars, right? To to uh, to institute freedom and democracy all over the world, yet they have this colony, you know, this piece of property that they own in its in its side pocket that nobody talks about. And we just kind of dismissed, you know, this this year was the four year anniversary of Hurricane Maria and there was no mention uh, of any of any of it. You know, you have 9-11 every year, people ring bells, it's on the news, it's in the newspaper and so on. Where was ours? I erected a monument at Taino Towers in New York City, and I had a, a, an event uh, surrounding that. And this is something that I hopefully, I want to continue to do every year for our community so that everyone knows that we are not forgotten. But again, it just falls under that same umbrella. 
because we are property, we, they do whatever they want to do with us. So we need to be free so that we can operate on our own. All right. And I do want to bring Yami in on this. Walter, I encourage you to, if you want to continue to comment, you know, keep your mic on and participate in the conversation. I also want to just say to Erica and Amal, if you have any contributions to make, don't you don't have to wait until I address you. You can certainly jump into the conversation. Um, Yami, I will say Walter sort of commented how, you know, as Puerto Ricans started coming to the United States, right, it was not the paradise that was, that was, it was perceived to be. Um, and I think that, you know, this factors a lot into sort of U.S. perceptions of migration, immigrants, right, citizens coming from Puerto Rico, why they come here. Um, this idea that perhaps, uh, you know, immigrants are coming just to live in paradise and have, a, have a, an easy life. Can you speak a little bit about some of the misperceptions that you've observed through your work and that you work to dispel through your advocacy and community programming? Sure, absolutely. Um, I think that in general, there's a, a misperception about uh, what percentage of immigrants come lawfully and illegally. And at the same time, why there are such soaring numbers of people who are crossing the border um, really to just survive and to seek, to, uh, to seek refuge. Um, and so through our work, which we primarily use uh, workshops within community members to sort of talk about the internalized traumas that they um, have garnered from living in a country that has such oppressive rhetoric for immigrants. Um, it's always that they feel First of all, there's there's always this fear that they um, that what they do here there's no safety net, right? That they can be easily deported back to their home countries. Which again, the reason that they're coming in the first place is to seek refuge from either countries that are suffering from extreme uh, climate crisis, um, yeah, from extreme just <laughs> environmental crises, uh, from either violent environments. Um, from poverty, famine, I mean, the list is endless, uh, but also to seek opportunity and to seek uh, a life that is safe, um, which unfortunately is not the conditions that they find when they arrive here. Um, there's, you know, misperceptions about immigrants not contributing to the major economy of the U.S., which we, you know, time and time again have debunked, you know, a million, uh, immigrants and undocumented immigrants you know, give billions and bill pay billions and billions of taxes each year alone. I think in the state of New Jersey, it's somewhere around 500 billion. Um, you know, even, even when we don't receive any of that social security aid or any of the relief funds that happened, especially this year in COVID, um, the misperceptions really go on and on. And I think what people need to understand at the end of the day is that when someone is coming here to seek refuge and to seek opportunity and a better life, it's um, there's very little ways that it's actually going to hurt the country, right? It's not, um, if anything, um, it's creating more opportunities, more jobs. And this is a country that was built on immigrants, right? And it's apart from it being a native land, an indigenous land, the people who came here were immigrants and we continue to, to build who we are because of immigrant communities. Um, and I think that even just the impacts of farmer workers and essential workers during COVID-19 showed how much we actually rely on the immigrant and essential work, working community. I'm really happy you just brought that up, Yanni, because I was just thinking, you know, as we sort of have been wrestling with these themes, this idea that we perceive as, as a country, right, this, this per, uh, pervasive narrative that, that advocates have, have and community members have worked to, to sort of battle back, there is this perception of immigrants as this burden, right? Um, arriving in this country, soaking up benefits. Meanwhile, right, benefits, as any practitioner or advocate knows, like by and large, benefits are completely exclusive to um, undocumented immigrants, but also just immigrants generally have, have varying levels of access to a variety of resources to which they pay. Um, and so I wonder if you could just speak a little bit more about this sort of the cognitive dissonance the nation has as immigrants are simultaneously a burden, but essential workers. Right. I know it. I mean, it's definitely cognitive dissonance. Um, 
And I think, you know, and I, I do just want to correct myself for one uh, thing I mentioned beforehand. Um, the amount of taxes that come from undocumented just immigrants in general in New Jersey is um, 500 million, not billions, uh, but might grow to billions, who knows? Uh, still, and, still a fairly large number. <laughs> yeah, huge number, right? Like considering that some of, uh, I think Phil Murphy is just, you know, trying to give back 40 million for COVID relief, like that's a drop of water, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, it's really uh, not going to do as much as is necessary. Um, but the cognitive dissonance that you're talking about, I mean, we have to look at, for example, farm workers, right? And we look at how much, how many percentage of people from the United States are taking, are you, are uh, in those jobs and in those career fields, but at the same time, how many US employers are actually asking for farm workers from El Salvador, from Mexico? Uh, during the Trump administration, the work visas actually went up by 13% uh, during a time when you know he was spewing rhetoric about building a wall. Um, the people that they needed, that they wanted to contract were from uh, Central America. And um, I think that, uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought there. Uh, but so, right, so with those working visas, that's just one example of the United States understands that with the undocumented community um, of workers primarily, there's almost this gap of um, a freedom that they can take because their lives that revolve around uh, the employers, right? They sort of get this jurisdiction about their wages and their livelihood and when they get to send get to be sent back when it uh, comes to temporary work visas. And even when it doesn't come to temporary work visas, undocumented workers uh, still are sort of living off of uh, whatever their employers uh, <laughs> give to them and the work conditions that they uh, that they, uh, that they provide for them to work in, which tend to be harmful and uh, unsafe and never really up to regulations and don't have any oversee of you know, what they, uh, they can and cannot do. There's no real security there. And so the cognitive dissonance, dissonance happens when you, know, you see, you have to ask yourself also, why would you even tolerate those conditions? And it's because that's really all there is. And I don't think that any, um, a citizen with documentation would allow themselves to work for $10 an hour when you're working brutal hours a week and barely get to see anything of it. Um, I think the cognitive dissonance lies there. Right, just circling back to the point you make about sort of the increase, you know, in visas for workers, um, but then we see that, you know, there's, there's very little CARES resources or COVID-related resources for that very same population. So we're demanding more from a population from whom we offer less, right? Um, and I think that that is something we can't overlook. Um, and I just sort of pose this to you, but I pose this to Amal or anyone else who would like to take up this issue. Um, I think you highlight a great point here when you bring in the employer because is the US really only serving employers at you know, the expense of immigrants? And what do we even see when it comes to labor protections in, in terms of undocumented immigrants? Because I think labor protections is already you know, something that needs a tremendous amount of advocacy in the United States. But as I'm visible has, you know, makes clear, and I'm sure you know, the ACLU has seen time and time again, undocumented workers or even farm workers with working visas who depart and return often experience wage theft or other kinds of you know right. labor violations and i wonder if any of you can speak to that um, a little bit more i'm um, sure i can chime in a little bit on that um you know you routinely we see farm workers excluded from labor protections in the united states um, that happens at the federal level at the state level um, there are a lot of efforts underway from advocacy organizations to try to resolve that and make sure that we um, are, are protecting farm workers with at least the bare minimum, right? Like we're not saying that farm workers deserve more protections than anybody else uh, or any other labor uh, uh, movement, uh, but they deserve actually um, at least equal footing as every other uh, industry. And we're not even seeing that, right? 
Um, and, and of course, farm worker uh, jobs are, are perhaps some of the most dangerous in the United States. Um, and uh, uh, some of these folks experience some serious trauma um, and, uh, and both physical and mental health conditions. Uh, and if they take a sick day, um, they may be out of the job, right? Like uh, there's nothing guaranteeing um, uh, that they are, are um, protected if they have to take care of themselves or their families. Um, one of the things that I wanted to touch on real quick was um, this idea of misperceptions in the United States about who immigrants are and, 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 um, and, and what they're entitled to. Uh, I teach a, uh, so I'm a constitutional and civil rights lawyer, and I, I teach a course, an undergrad course on, on constitutional rights. And one of the questions that I ask early on in this course of my students is, um, who is protected by the constitution of the United States? And without fail, at least one or a handful of students will say citizens of the United States. Uh, it seems like an instinctive natural response to say citizens of the United States. Um, however, it, it's a surprise to my students when I tell them that everybody in the United States, regardless of their citizenship status, is protected by the Constitution of the United States, including the Bill of Rights, which um, protects people from uh, unreasonable government searches and seizures, protects people from uh, cruel and unusual punishment, it protects their freedom of speech, um, it protects their due process rights, um, and, and we're seeing routinely, and it protects, you know, it, it, it protects their uh, equal protection under the law, which is, you know, to be not treated differently because of your identity, your race, your religion, or whatever, whatever you have. Um, and uh, we see routinely that these principles, these ideals are, are so often ignored or put aside um, for, uh, uh, for immigrant communities and particularly undocumented communities. One clear example of this is if you are arrested in the criminal legal system for committing a crime or allegedly committing a crime, you are entitled to an attorney uh, in the United States. If you are arrested because you're suspected of being undocumented, and you're put into immigration detention, which, by the way, is oftentimes the same facility as we use for the criminal legal system, you are not entitled to an attorney. Um, and, uh, and in New Jersey, we're taking steps to remedy that by creating a program to allow for people who are facing removal from the states to uh, have a public defender style attorney help them uh, navigate the system. However, uh, it's not something that is um, uh, you know, that is uh, 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 given to folks as a matter of course, uh, yet the conditions of confinement, the, the, um, uh, the, the consequences are sometimes just as brutal or even more dire than in the criminal legal system. And so when people are in immigration detention, and I know we'll talk more about detention and enforcement in a bit, uh, but when people are in those circumstances, you know, it's, it's um, uh, not only dangerous for them, there's a particular loneliness to it because um, folks are, uh, who have families who are also undocumented are oftentimes prohibited or choose not to go visit their relatives who are incarcerated um, because uh, at the risk of outing themselves as being undocumented in the United States. And also there is oftentimes a language barrier, right? Like there's oftentimes um, folks who are incarcerated who don't speak the same language as those who are operating the facilities. And that creates um, you know, it, it, the, whenever you ins, insert um, police or corrections officers into a situation, you often are met with an escalating situation, uh, add a, a, a language barrier into that mix and miscommunication into that mix, uh, that escalation happens much more quickly. Um, and so I think um, uh, there are a lot of ways in which um, even though we are, as a, as a country, supposed to protect people under the constitution, regardless of their immigration status, that we're not meeting that goal um, and, and folks are being denied uh, dignity and equality as a result. Thank you, Amal. Um, and I really appreciate you if I, if I may. Um, sort of with your sort of class experience regarding rights because circling back to Yami, I just, you know, as we have this conversation about, you know, policy change or changing the law, um, you know, it seems like a preliminary step that has to happen is sort of attacking and addressing and correcting the record as it pertains to these misconceptions. And so now I wanna just ask you a little bit about the work that you and I'm Visible is doing um, to sort of take a solution oriented approach to sort of change the narrative, right? And to say like, we are here. 
um, through like our community engagement, through our advocacy? Um, what what have what do you see as the solution to sort of change? You know, I guess you know this term is used for other other topics, but you know to change those hearts and minds of people that is a necessary step to have changes in law and policy, right? Mm. Right. Uh, well, part of what we do is we want to offer some. We want to offer a basically a platform, right, for people who have narratives that need to be heard in order to even start to understand what the true story is, right? And not the and not hyper focus so much on the um, misconceptions. And so something that I'm Visible provides is we're beginning to work more and more with community organizations, grassroots organizations, to sort of be the um, the art wing of their campaigns. Uh, it's not about sort of reinventing the wheel here, but just supporting it. Um, and so part of our advocacy work is collaborating and creating public messaging, public art that talks directly about uh, or interrupts these myths, uh, these narratives that are simply untrue. Um, how we have done that is through uh, community festivals that we have hosted. Um, just this year, actually, we worked on a community festival. I would love to give you an opportunity if you have any slides you want to show along with the yes. events <laughs> to, to have them queued up. <laughs> Absolutely, we definitely do. Um, so the We Are Home Murals Market Music Festival was a collaboration that we did with the Four Corners Project. Um, we have some photos of the posters that are part of that project. Um, there is a, there's going to be a monumental um, mural that's going to happen in downtown Newark, uh, hopefully in the spring of 2022. Uh, but the poster series that we worked on with uh, immigrant artists, some international from Ecuador, um, some from New Jersey, was a way for us to use both art and resources to spread the word about what's available um, to support the immigrant and undocumented community for low cost to free. I think a lot of times um, you mentioned um, language barrier being a part of uh, what, what, ends, what tends to happen, or I mean, well, just in general, the language barrier sometimes interrupts people from either seeking help or knowing what's actually out there. And so our posters are translated in Spanish and English. We're hoping to translate them in Creole and in different languages uh, for the community in New Jersey to be able to see what's here, uh, what's already existing, what's, who are the communities that are here that are visible to, that um, can support them in, in a range of categories from education to free legal system, free legal services, um, housing, food security. Uh, then that's just one way, right? I think if someone sees a poster that resembles uh, who they are, resembles parts of their narrative, their interests, their cultures, they're more intrigued and more inclined to, to take a look and to read it. And especially if it's in their language too. Um, there's something about building that solidarity through visuals and art uh, that, that people just, we gravitate towards. And even someone who maybe it's, it's not for can see it and may know somebody that they could spread it to. Um, that's one way in which we are starting to change the narrative and also give direct support and resources. Um, most recently, yes, uh, so if we could show the slides of the posters, that'd be wonderful. Um, they're really beautiful. The artists work super hard on them. This was at the actual festival. This was in collaboration with the Newark Project. He, uh, Gabe, who's the founder, created a billboard, a, well, a banner that said Newark is for immigrants. And people who went to the festival got to sign it, sign the countries that they were from. And it was amazing to see the, just the variety of countries that people are coming from, repping either if they're first generation, second or third. Uh, it just emphasizes that Newark is a city of immigrants and beyond just Newark, you know, we are a country of immigrants. Um, if we could go to the next slides. These are some of the posters uh, that the artist made for us. And if you check out our website at invisible.org, you can uh, see more about that. But this is an example of some of the posters and what they look like. And our, our goal is essentially to spread these to as many people as we can for free. And this billboard is one of our most recent projects with a in, in collaboration with a project called Breakout that's Chicago-based. Um, 
they basically gave us the support that we needed in order to create this billboard message that was up on Route 21 for about a month. Um, and it says, we protect each other. No human is illegal on stolen land. And this was a direct response to what was happening in the south of the border with Haitian immigrants um, that we saw a couple of months ago were being horribly whipped um, by, by ICE agents. And so our direct response to that was saying, you know, we are here to protect each other. We are going to continue to show up for each other. And if we go back to the billboard, you know, uh, the other co-founder of Invisible, like Wanuna Yawar, who is um, the artist, we both designed it to visualize, you know, what it actually looks like for these grassroots communities to fight back and to say, you are not going to whip us. You are not going to hurt us. You may try but we are gonna still be here. Our resiliency, our voices are loud and they're not going to be silenced easily. Um, and so this is the sort of work that we are going to continue to do uh, to reverse that narrative and to really tell the stories that are out there and to amplify the voices of the organizations and grassroots communities that are doing this work actively alongside with us. Uh, Jason, would it, would it be okay for I could chime in very briefly? Sure, Walter. Yes, please chime in. Yeah, um, very briefly. I wanted to go uh, this, discuss something we were talking about misrepresentation, and, and we, we need to look at the misrepresentation from the other side. People come here uh, because they, you know, they call these countries where where we come from third world countries or very poor and so on and so forth. But that's that's not necessarily the case. You know, the people may be poor, but it's the land that's rich. Puerto Rico got its name, Rich Port, because it was so rich with, you know, uh, with the the uh, minerals and, and resources that they had on the island uh, during the time of Columbus. You know, Africa has, uh, you know, copper, gold, diamond, uh, lithium, you know, one of the one of the every something that those are one of the things that are used in just about every cell phone today. You know, in, in Central and South America, you know, you have oil and, and so on. So these countries that these so-called third world countries are rich in resources, but the problem is, is that they are not owned by that country. They're owned by the French, the Dutch, America, the British. They own all the resources in those lands. So although the land may be rich, it's actually the people that are poor. And so, and where there is high poverty, there is high crime. So all that combined, you know, we're working down there for those same slave wages that, that we um, basically do up here. So that's why we have this mass migration. It's not because, uh, you know, the countries are, are in terrible, terrible shape. It's just that we don't own the resources in those in these countries because that the United States and all these European countries would not invest in Central and South America and Africa if they were poor. They're there for a reason. They're there in, in you know, in, in Afghanistan and so on for a reason because they want the resources on in those countries so we have to take a look at that misrepresentation because they they look at it like it's just oh well they're just poor lazy people and we're un unorganized and we just want to murder each other no that's not the case at all the problem is we don't own what's in what's in our own land so therefore that's why we you know we, we try to come here you know to the u.s or so on so for a a better life Right. <clears throat> just circling. I mean, and that's, I'm sure, just the tip of the iceberg, just quickly circling back um, to comments you've made, right? The U.S., the great proliferator of democracy, certainly toppled yeah. some democratic regimes in favor of regimes that had better trade agreements with the United yeah. States. So just to, to put a finer point on, on the example that you're offering, um, at the risk of making a hard transition here, I do want to turn just to sort of the, the, the harsh welcome, right, that migrants have received, right? So now we've seen a little bit of, uh, you know, U.S. impact on a variety of nations around the world, um, our own commonwealths. Um, but I want to just sort of now direct the conversation more towards Amal and get a little bit of a background on sort of U.S. detention and sort of the way that the U.S. has typically um, engaged with individuals who have fallen, you know, on the wrong side of immigration or have violated immigration law in a system that is that is significantly broken. Um, sure. Well, where do I begin? I mean, I, I, there's there's uh, so much um, that has developed over the past 
several decades um, in the world of immigrants, immigration law uh, that has allowed for um, that has allowed for folks to um, uh, for governments to detain people and um, and es effectively make them disappear um, in order to uh, secure our borders. Um, but what I think what it's important to also acknowledge our history a little bit. Um, you know, it, it, people oftentimes talk about um, you know getting in line or coming here the right way or making sure you know like there's there's a common talking point of of you know it's not that uh, we we disagree with immigration we just want legal immigration get come here in, in the way that you're supposed to um, and the reality is that the way we're supposed to come to the United States changes with every generation and with in some cases every administration um, you know it's no surprise that the uh, first immigration law to the United States was called the Chinese Exclusion Act. Um, it was meant to prohibit a particular population from coming into the United States. Um, it, it, it's, it's no surprise that it wasn't until the 50s that the, uh, you, that the United States barred naturalized citizenship um, from, uh, or left it only for uh, free white persons. Um, and and that I think is telling that like you know there was a, two Supreme Court cases one about uh, a Japanese American and one about an Indian American the Indian American who actually served in the U.S. Army in World War One uh, was still denied citizenship in the United States um, and uh, and I think about my own family you know had my father come to this country a decade earlier. Um, in the previous decade he he wouldn't have been able to apply for citizenship in the United States and it's just. You know, uh, and and I think the the nature of of um, immigration law has evolved to allow for people to apply for citizenship. The 1965 Immigration Act allowed for skilled labor from uh, Asia to come into the United States, and that's what late rate allowed for an influx uh, of people to come here. Uh, but we also have things like Japanese internment in our past, right? Like where um, uh, people were uh, rounded up solely based on not their immigration status, but their ethnicity, right? Like, so even Japanese Americans who were born in the United States were sent, sent to internment camps uh, because they were perceived to be a threat. Um, we had uh, um, post 9-11 in the, in the aftermath of 9-11, in the immediate aftermath of 9-11, um, we had thousands of people in the New York metro area rounded up because they were perceived to be a threat because of their immigration status in combination with their uh, with the their national origin. Um, and here in, in in New Jersey, in Passaic County, we held hundreds of people as a result of this roundup. Um, and uh, and I think you know that sometimes gets lost. So uh, uh, the law is a uh, as much as a, we like to think that there's something objective about it, um, that there's right and wrong embedded in the law. It is a subjective tool and it's a creature of convenience. Um, and it oftentimes is able to be manipulated uh, for the powers that be. And it is not immune from white supremacy. Um, there's always been, uh, in fact, it's, it's founded on white supremacy. And I think there's always been this desire to view it as something above us. There's, all, there's always this desire to view the founding fathers as knowing something more than what we might know. There's always this desire to look at the Constitution, which, look, I, I, I often say that the ACLU is a protector of the Constitution, but we are very aware that the Constitution is imperfect, um, that it has flaws, that the ideals of the Constitution of equality and justice for all, all are never met, um, and, um, and there are people for whom the Constitution has failed, and that's what we try to resolve in our work. But to answer your question about um, some of the uh, the ways in which um, in, you know enforcement and other things work in the United States, and 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 the ways in which people are treated when they come into the United States, look, we we have a system that is um, based on incarceration and criminalization, right? Um, so we can't separate the way immigrants are treated from the way um, folks in the criminal legal system are treated. Um, they're oftentimes the, the, our first resort instinct is to make things go away, right? Um, whether it's people um, pre-trial going to jail before they can have a hearing and their right to due process, or it's immigrants coming into the United States and are putting in, put, put in camps or um, in, in immigration detention. 
Uh, and this is not something, you know, usually under the law, immigration is in the purview of the federal government. Uh, but I have to remind folks that there are there is a long history of local law enforcement enforcing federal immigration law. I saw a question in the chat about how do we eliminate the fear that people have of, of being um, uh, deported. One of the best ways to do that is to disrupt the connection between local law enforcement and federal immigration authorities and to make sure that local law enforcement it has no business in enforcing federal immigration law and uh, and make sure that the community knows that that you know the New Jersey the, the North New Jersey police are not going to ask you about your immigration status. They're not going to uh, come to a scene of a crime and start inquiring about who's here and who's documented and who's not. Uh, because what that will do is not only put those people in jeopardy, it will also discourage future cooperation with police. It'll also uh, keep our communities less safe because. Uh, me as a as somebody who who has an immigrant family may not feel comfortable talking to law enforcement. It's going to continue to erode that trust, um, and I think that is a uh, uh, part of the way in which the immigration system in the United States is broken. Is that we're um, we're so used to policing things and making things go away in this country and criminalizing things, um, and the immigration system is no exception. And if I may jump in there, like at the community level, letting folks know these are your rights, um, as scary as it might be to like confront a police officer or an ICE agent in that moment on the street at your house, um, here is um, you are well in your right to not respond to any questions, right? You can ask for a warrant. Um, having those um, conversations with community members is super, super crucial, right? Um, to start um, building some or like eroding some of that fear um, and also like building a little bit of power in that person, right? Um, and letting them know um, that they also have rights um, and that while as much as ICE and the police might try to intimidate them, um, that they can enact those rights in that moment. Um, and that's super important. That's like one of my favorite things to do when we're working with immigrant communities, to let them know these are your rights um, so, so as to decrease some of that fear um that they have in their everyday lives all right so i just want to circle back uh to two points um and amal i just you know i think it's really important to just to highlight too this idea that the framers you know knew more than we know lest we forget that they owned people right the majority of framers own people and we can't just fail to acknowledge that right um i also just want to um take up a point from Erica here, you know, KYR, right? Know Your Rights is such a critical piece of this work, but detention in a lot of ways, ways serves to separate regular people, right? Immigrants, regular people from access to attorneys or access to supports like friends and family that might, you know, gather resources to, to gain someone's freedom. Amal, I wonder if you can speak a little bit about uh, some of the conditions we've seen in detention, because I think it would be remiss of us, you know, not to highlight the, the conditions that these people who have violated civil laws in the United States are subjected to, right? So these conditions often mirror, if not are worse than the conditions that people who are convicted of crimes are living in. Um, the Inspector General reports over the past decade reveal that time and time again. So if you could please just speak a little bit about that, and then I guess you know, the battle to take this out of New Jersey at, at you know, on the local level um, and, and sort of where you see that fight going in terms of obstacles and hopefully, you know, a lasting solution. Sure, um, thanks for the prompt. I, look, I, I don't think anybody, regardless of whether they are accused of a crime or has uh, come into this country in a way that was not permitted or is um, convicted of a crime uh, should live in inhumane in conditions. Um, I, I think we have a, a responsibility as a country to make sure that even if, so if we are choosing to incarcerate people in this country, if there are going to be people in state custody, the state has a responsibility to make sure that those conditions are humane um, and that we treat people with dignity. Um, and, and so uh, to your question, you know, prison conditions all over the United States are awful. Like there's no prison that is, is good. Um, uh, you know, there are 
uh, some places that are doing better than others in terms of conditions, but they're all, um, you know, they, they're all laden with indignity and, um, and the bare minimum of, of having something like edible food is seen like, um, you know, we're at a five-star resort or something like that. I mean, I think there's, um, there is a lot of room for improvement, but to your point, the inspector general's uh, reports from Essex County, where we um, have, have had until recently uh, immigrant detainees uh, was just horrifying. Like they, they have um, terrible conditions, terrible sanitary conditions, uh, mold, black mold growing everywhere, um, food that's inedible. Um, you know, there's- uh, Expired uh, and rotten food. Just expired and rotten food. Clear point on it. Yeah, there's violence um, against uh, detainees, uh, both in the, in the criminal side and in the immigration side. Um, there is uh, uh, accusations of, of sexual assault and, and, and things like that throughout facilities in New Jersey. Um, these are all things that need to be cured. These are all things that we need accountability for. One of the, one of the best things that, um, uh, one, of, one of the things, not best things, one of the things that we could be doing um, is uh, creating oversight bodies to uh, ensure that there is a place outside of the government to go to um, for people to complain about conditions. Um, and, and I think any time that we as a, as a country um, or as a state choose to pe keep people incarcerated, we ought to have independent oversight to make sure that people can uh, you know, address the conditions of their confinement and uh, the abuses they may face. Um, you asked about where we're headed and, um, and, and what the world looks like. Well, one of the things that I'm um, encouraged by is that because of a direct result of the political pressure that protesters and organizations like Make the Road and uh, ACLU and, and, and many other organizations throughout Wind of the Spirit and many other organizations throughout the state um, has done, um, it, it, they have uh, Essex, Bergen and uh, Hudson County jails, which used to house immigrant detainees have uh, now ended their relationships with ICE. Um, and that is really remarkable and great. Um, you know, they did it not because of the goodness of their hearts, but because of all of the attention of the abuses that were happening there and all the work of, of protesters and activists who made them do so. Um, and, but the problem is that these people were released uh, or not released, they were transferred, excuse me. Um, they were transferred to other facilities. So the same protections that they might have and the same access to family that they might have in New Jersey are not necessarily available to them in places like Buffalo or Louisiana or wherever else they might be. Um, so one of the things that we've been advocating for, in addition to all of our partners in the immigrants' rights arena, is release people. Let's not just transfer them to a, a worse location. Let's release them. And, um, and there's, there is, has been a portion of the population that has been released, but we can do much better in the United States and, um, and try to end immigration detention altogether. We don't want to see a world where anybody is detained as a result of their immigration status. And we thought that we would have faster results under a Biden administration and as compared to a Trump administration. Um, however, the results aren't coming fast enough. Thank you, Jamal, um, for that. I'm sorry, there's not enough time for you to really get into it, but thank you so much for summing it up as you did. Um, obviously, the, the fight for human rights is not just bound to you know, detention. You know, there is ongoing campaigns and, and fights that are being waged across the nation and right here in our backyard in New Jersey. I wanna to turn to Erica now just to focus on some of the wonderful campaigns that Make the Road New Jersey has championed um, that have made really tangible change um, in the state of New Jersey. But before we do that, Erica, if you could just speak a little bit about some of the, I guess, issues we faced, right? As far as, before these, these changes happened, what were the issues facing young people as far as vocational licensing or licensing at all to drive, right? And what that meant for public safety, um, having different access to these sorts of, um, you know, licenses and the insurance that comes with them and different things of that nature. Yeah, totally. I think I want to start off with the message of like, 
immigrant communities are fighting back, right? Um, they're fighting back now. They were fighting back um, in 2016, right? When it felt like the world was ending. Um, and like immigrant communities are fighting back in New Jersey to make sure that New Jersey is the state that we want to live in and that our families feel safe in um, and where we're living without fear, right? Um, so I, I just wanna say, right? Um, five years ago, right, um, when we were thinking about, um, like, all of this anti-immigrant rhetoric, right, and all of these threats about ICE raids, um, what community, immigrant communities were lacking driver's licenses, right, um, so what, like, easy things like going grocery shopping, right, taking your kids to a doctor's off, um, a doctor's appointment, all of those things became really hard for immigrant families that didn't have access to a driver's license, right, um, and at that time, um, immigrant communities didn't have access to occupational licenses, right? Um, at that time, there was no financial aid for immigrant youth that were wanting to go to um, college, right? And that had been to a New Jersey high school for the, their entire life, right? Or like most of what they could remember of their life, right? Um, and what we did um, at Make the Road New Jersey, right, with the help of our partners, the ACLU, Wind of the Spirit, um, and so many organizations that I want to name off, right? Um, what we did is we started thinking like, we need access to driver's licenses, we need access to occupational licenses, we need access to financial aid. Um, so there's some beautiful, beautiful pictures um, of our our communities um, heading down to Trenton in hundreds, right, um, and saying we need access to driver's licenses. Um, our families need it. Um, we need it to get to work. We need it to get to school. Um, and here we are, right? Um, we are here fighting for um, a driver's license, which might seem so um, random, right, but it's life-changing to these families um, that need um, to drive, to, that need to drive to school and work. Right, um, and well, that was I exist. Right? Yes, I am I recognized do. by the community in which I live. This is so important. Exactly, exactly, um, and um, that's a victory. That's probably one of like the greatest memories that I'll ever have in my life. Um, being there in Trenton the day that the bill was passed, um, and just seeing families, um, moms hugging their kids, um, and being really excited that they'll be able to finally drive, right? Be able to have a driver's license um, to make their winters and their summers a little easier um, in going to get groceries and doing laundry, right? Um, and that was a great victory. That gave us a lot of momentum in um, New Jersey. Uh, and also uh, a few years before that, right, um, just me even starting off as a youth leader at Make the Road New Jersey, 16 years old, um, just knowing that I wanted to go to college, not knowing how I would afford it without FAFSA um, as an undocumented student, and meeting other immigrant youth at Make the Road New Jersey and saying, hey, um, we can pass a bill here in New Jersey um, to give us um, access to financial aid, going to state senators and assembly people um, and telling them our stories. You know, we want to go to college. We've been to school in New Jersey for years, and this is our next step, and we want to make it happen, and you can help us make it happen. We need your support. Um, and then making sure that they knew the impact of this um, until right in 2017, um, we were there when it was um, signed um, and also passed, right? We were there to actually vote yes um, on the bill, on the floor um, of the Senate. Um, so, right, like in, in the times where it felt like the federal um, government was attacking us, ripping DACA away from us, right? Um, we said here in New Jersey, this is what we're going to do to make sure that immigrant communities feel protected um, and, right, to show them our power, um, the power of our community. Um, and then, right, the follow-up campaign to financial aid, right, now that I can go to college and I can study to be a teacher, a doctor, a physical therapist, right, um, now I can also get my license. Right. And that's another campaign that immigrant youth launched um, and won um, just this past year, a year ago in September during the pandemic. Right. Acknowledging also we need 
occupational licenses for health workers, right? Um, immigrants can also be health workers, right? We are already on the front lines um, as essential workers, and we can also be healthcare workers to help in this pandemic, right? Um, so I, I guess the, the beauty of what's happening here in New Jersey um, and the power that we're building in our immigrant communities um, is that we're fighting for the state that we want to live in, right? We're fighting for the state where we're living with respect and dignity. Um, and now because of the work that is happening here in New Jersey um, and the community organizing efforts that are going on, we have access to driver's licenses. Um, we have access to occupational licenses, the first state on the East Coast to do that. Um, and we have um, access to um, financial aid, right? Um, so I hope this gives folks a little bit of hope of like what community um, and people power can do um, when, when it is that we envision the state that we wanna live in, right? Um, and the fight's not over there. Um, I'll transition um, a little bit briefly into like the national work, right? Um, immigrant communities still live in fear of being separated, right? There's still this fear of my, my DACA, right? My DACA's in limbo, TPS is in limbo. Um, whatever protection status it is that I have is always in limbo, right? Um, a few of like the immigrant youth that I work with were really excited to submit their DACA applications. And now that's on pause, right? Um, so, right, in thinking about not only my and like my experience and others' experiences as, as an undocumented youth, but also people like our parents, right? And people that have lived in the United States for years without status, right? Like the solution for all of this uncertainty um, for living without fear is a pathway to citizenship, right? Um, especially coming out of a pandemic where immigrants were frontline workers. Um, so now our broader fight um, ties in beautifully with Yamie's work, right? Which is we are home. Um, citizenship for all, for all 11 million, right? Citizenship for TPS holders, DACA recipients, farm workers, essential workers. Um, and we're calling on senators um, and representatives to include um, citizenship in reconciliation, right? In the reconciliation process um, and telling them right now to ignore the, the parliamentarian um, an unelected official, I will add, um, to include citizenship in um, the reconciliation um, process um, so that our communities don't have to live in fear, right? So that um, our lives aren't in limbo um, and aren't like, torn away from us, our sense of security um, isn't torn away from us at any given point, right? Um, so I said a lot <laughs> um, and I went on a little bit of a rant, right? Um, but I think my biggest message for tonight is um, that immigrant communities are in our fighting, right? We're building power um, and we're also fighting for a pathway to citizenship. Um, for all of us, um, and You're in my brain, and you anticipated my prompts. Nice yes. work. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we do have to start to wind down our conversation. Um, even just your final point, sort of about unelected officials, just brings me back to when I was watching uh, Walter's documentary and sort of how you know the the mainland dealt with the financial crisis where facing Puerto Rico under Obama. And so as I, as I start to go around to each of you in your, your you know, two minute closing remarks about what you hope you know, the audience will take away today, I'll hand it to Walter just to make a final statement sort of um, to, to lead the way here. Okay, uh, well, um, two minutes, wow, that's tight. Uh, it's it's in, uh, a few minutes in your brain, two to three. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I think uh, one of the things that we have to do is um, we have to lobby. We, we have to use the, the means that we have. So we have to lobby Congress. We have to, you know, if we have the right to vote, then we have to uh, hold accountable these congressmen, these politicians who, who make the laws and basically have the, the authority to grant Puerto Rico its independence. 
So we have to hold these these uh, politicians and senators and congressmen and so on. We have to hold them accountable. We have to put pressure on them when they come around looking for our vote and they say, hey, you know, what do you want for, you know, for, for your, your future, lower taxes, uh, better schools? I say, well, I want independence for Puerto Rico. And if they can't give you a direct answer, then you don't vote for them. And this is one way of, of keeping them out of their office that they're so eager uh, to to hold. Another way. I'm sorry about that. Another way. Another, another way would be us, the the community. Uh, we have to get involved. We have to take action here as well as abroad, if possible. We need to. Uh, create better conditions in our own land so that this way, you know, because of the, the current crisis in Puerto Rico, like, for example, I am in the process of trying to acquire a school in Puerto Rico. There's over 600 schools that closed in Puerto Rico because of the economic crisis. So that's, you know, hundreds of thousands of students without a future, without any education. Those schools have become available to the general public. If you can turn the school around into a community center, the shelter for domestic violence, the government will actually sell you the school. So we, as the 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 uh, the people on this side, we have to take advantage, and we have to create opportunities back home. We cannot forget about what's happening back home. We we can't expect anyone else to change the conditions of our island back home, or wherever you're from. You know, Cuba, Dominican Republic, South America, Central America, anywhere. We have to try to create better conditions in our own land, and and we have to try so that this way the the people that remain on the island. Um, they can have better conditions and they can have a, a, a better and, and hopefully a, a prosperous future. We live in the richest country here. We can repatriate the money back home. We can invest in, in land, in property. Uh, you know, we can create businesses back home. And, and this way we can create better living conditions, hopefully, for the community. Thank you, Walter. And I'm sure we're going to circle back with Q&A. So there'll be another opportunity to, to hit some key points. Um, Yemi, I'll hand it off to you now. Sure. Absolutely. I think um, one of my final points is that, you know, with the climate crisis, immigration and migration is just going to continue to rise in numbers. Migration has already been a natural process of life and evolution. And we have to really come together and understand that migration is an intersectional issue. Immigrant Immigration is an intersectional issue. And so when we unite with our power, when we unite in our voices and see how powerful and how remarkable our stories are, we can start creating more change, supporting community organizations, even with just a share, you know, coming to these conversations, sharing with your family members, things that you learned or with your community that makes the world of the difference. Um, because at the end of the day, you know, this is our home and we are, we're here to stay and we're here to fight for our rights and for all of the communities that have not, have been marginalized and have been unheard and that need to be finally seen. Thank you, Yemi. Amal? Um, yeah, thanks. You know, I, I guess one thing I will pick up on that Yemi mentioned is the intersectionality of things. Um, you know, immigrants' rights uh, is a racial justice issue. Um, we have to see, you know, all of these problems that we are experiencing, whether it's the uh, criminal legal system or a dysfunctional immigration system, as symptoms of the same problem, which is that um, there has been a top-down perpetuation of fear and hate instilled in our narratives, both uh, at the federal level, at the local level, and even neighbor to neighbor, um, that leads to this discrimination that we see against people of color in this country. Um, whether it's you know people who are documented, people who are undocumented, people who are citizens, um, we are all experiencing different degrees of oppression um, from the same institutions that are meant to serve us. Um, and I think that is um, something that I hope people can recognize. And also, you know, I saw some questions about how, um, how to talk to people who are disagreeable, um, who, who, you know, want to, uh, you know, pit immigrant communities against working class communities. Um, you know, I have to say, uh, like, you know, the, the status quo benefits when we're all fighting each other and fighting for crumbs. Um, and, um, and the power structures that be are, are um, you know profiting off of us fighting um, and um, and one of the you know questions that I saw in the comments is about um, is about uh, uh, healthcare and access to healthcare for immigrant communities and and others um, you know it's the insurance companies that are benefiting right like we 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 can kid ourselves into thinking that 
um, that, you know, me paying into an insurance company is actually subsidizing healthcare for immigrant communities, but really it's the profit that is going to insurance companies and others that are, um, that, that the money is actually going towards. It's not actually, you know, um, uh, subsidizing anything. And so I think what we really need to be aware of is who stands to benefit from oppression um, and how do we disrupt that pipeline of oppression and make sure that we are fighting for everybody. Um, and, uh, and driver's licenses is a perfect example. Um, why was it that people were denied driver's licenses, right? Like why, it makes the road safer. Um, it, it, you know, somebody uh, once asked me about that issue and asked, you know, aren't we just incentivizing people to break the law, right? By coming into this country and into the state because we're offering them driver's licenses. And I said to them that, no, we're actually creating a pathway for people to be in compliance with the law. We're actually saying like, you can obtain a driver's license and do everything that you need to do, contribute to the economy, take your kids to school, participate in, in civic forums, um, and make sure that we are actually helping people by offering them something that allows them to uh, drive legally in this, in this state. And, and I think uh, what we need to do is hold our government officials accountable, question the, the instincts that we have to exclude rather than include, and, um, and make sure that we don't take uh, steps backwards right now, because I know there's a lot of talk in the legislature in New Jersey and in the governor's office and elsewhere to move to the center, whatever that might mean. Um, let's stop embracing progressive policies because of the election results that we saw. Um, let's you know, make sure that people know that, that, that the only reason um, people move to a state like New Jersey is to embrace progress. Thank you, Amal. And Erica, your final comments before we transition to Q&A. Yeah, totally. So um, before we close for tonight um, or head into a QA, and a um, I want to give folks an opportunity to take action in one of the easiest ways um, that you possibly can. I'll be dropping a link um, into the chat. Um, it takes two minutes to send an email to your representative, to your senators, right? Um, just fill out your information and then it'll automatically send an email. Um, and the message is simple, right? It's we need a pathway to citizenship now, right? Um, not yesterday, um, not the day before then, right now. Um, our communities have waited way too long. Um, and right, the opportunity is now. Um, we have we have a, an administration that has said that they are on their on our side, right? We have senators that have said that they stand with immigrant communities, um, and now is the time to show for them that they actually on our are on our side, um, and that they will deliver a pathway to citizenship, um, and right through a pathway to citizenship, um, a sense of security, right, a sense of stability in life, less fear, um, acknowledging. Um, all of the work that immigrants did during the pandemic, um, and also giving a giving a better future to um, young immigrants, right, that have built their lives here already and just need that next step. Um, so if everybody could take two minutes, right, and fill out that link um, and send an email to their representative, um, it'd be really, really great, um, especially considering that these next few weeks are crucial to our movement. Um, and, right, it's the easiest way to take action um, and support us now. Um, and also, again, right, if you want to be become involved in this movement um, and also like create the New Jersey that you want to live in um, with respect, dignity, equity, right? All of the themes that we touched on tonight, I would really encourage you um, to follow um, all of the organizations um, that are represented on tonight's panel. Um, I'll give our handle um, and then I encourage everybody else to also do the same so you can follow along on all of the amazing work that everybody is doing. Um, we are at Make the Road and J on all platforms. Um, if you want to get involved, if you want to keep up with um, the movement, um, all of that good stuff. Um, so thank you, everybody, again. I just want to do some really quick housekeeping. So we're going to transition to Q&A. The event is slotted for 8.30, but we're going to continue through roughly 8.45 with a hard stop. So, um, you know, just a heads up to our panelists. Um, the first question is from Rich. I, I'm going to paraphrase it, um, but basically, you know, there's a, a historical narrative of immigrants entering the United States in the late 1800s, early 1900s, 
documented through Ellis Island, but as we've touched on tonight, you know, the, the immigration system was not the same then as it is now in terms of restrictions. Um, and so what I, I put this, I guess, to the whole panel, um, what work can or should be done to sort of draw parallels between immigrants then and now and how nothing has really changed. Um, and perhaps, like, is there a way that this can be used to sort of shine a light on immigration, not just itself, but kind of how there are these legacies of, I guess, you know, what we've highlighted, prejudicial, prejudicial views of who's coming, right? Uh, you know, immigration really hasn't changed in the United States, right? Just the laws have changed. Yeah. Um, well, well, I think if, um, if if I may, I, I want to think I can if I can jump in. Um, things have changed. The change is that it's no longer the majority of Europeans that are coming into this country. Now it's people of color. So now, because there is a a, a threat of so many people of color entering into this country, the dominant culture is afraid of basically. It seems like losing its its own identity. The, the mass amount of people that are coming into this country are, are mostly people of color, and the country basically is getting darker. Now, um, that's always been kind of the fear for the dominant culture, you know, and it's a problem because the dominant culture is what controls everything. They control the government. They're all the top CEOs. They control the media. So um, they hold all the keys to all the doors. So it's, it's going to be a bit difficult because the same people that are oppressing us are the same people that we have to go to to try to make this change. So uh, that's that's going to be a very long and difficult road to uh, to try to change, you know, to, to try to ease in, uh, you know, more and more people of color uh, coming into this country because, um, you know, that there's a big stop sign, you know, that uh, that Uncle Sam, you know, like, the, you know, like the says we want you. Well, it, you know, it's like in reverse. We don't want you. You know what I mean? Because they're they 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 the they're afraid of the of the, of the country becoming, um, you know, a, a darker. And, uh, you know, and, and I think that's that's going to be a, a big factor. So it's you know, it, it doesn't look very, very bright, I should <laughs> you know, for our for our community. Certainly, there were some scandalous uh, news stories about how the administration framed immigrants and the countries from which they came in the past administration that could definitely highlight your point. We'll go to Yami and then Erica. Yeah, I actually just want to um, highlight a, a great project based here in Newark at Rutgers University called Newest Americans. And um, they do a great job at uh, creating multimedia storytelling. Uh, and if um, I'm trying to find the stories now so I can link them in the in the chat, but there's um, they've done a great job at archiving a lot of the immigrants that came during the Ellis Island uh, era into the Ironbound directly because the Ironbound in Newark has always been a port city and sort of an international pinpoint. And so, you know, we've seen uh, German populations, Polish, and um, all of these different communities, and now Central American, um, Haitian, and it it does great job at really highlighting how we're really one and the same, how we're all sort of coming for very similar reasons. Um, the, like, uh, like you were saying, Jason, the laws have changed, but in actuality, you know, not much about why we migrate has. So um, I'll just put that in there so that I think if, if you are having any discussions with family members, friends, or you find yourself in that sort of um, discussion where they're saying, um, just, just spewing negativity, you can share this with them to kind of enlighten them and um, start seeing more, more of the uh, bigger picture. Erica, did you have a comment? I wasn't sure if you tried to jump in before. Oh, okay, sorry. All right, um, and then the next uh, question I'm going to highlight is, um, it's from an anonymous um, audience member, but there has been a significant campaign of misinformation spread through social media, and I wonder, um, or the question, you know, wonders whether uh, there are affirmative plans to sort of address that issue specifically, right? Sort of debunking misinformation or even attacking the platforms that, you know, share this misinformation that is so influential across the U.S. population. And I don't know if that's. Oh, could you repeat that question again? <laughs> sure. 
Uh, so um, we've heard a lot about the campaign of misinformation and through um, outlets like social media, Instagram, lots of information about immigrant communities that is not accurate has been uh, you know, shared right among uh, members of the US community. What can we do or what is being done to address this in misinformation? Is it a matter of just having our own campaigns? Like I'm visible to share information that is accurate or is there something more that can be done like holding Facebook or holding Instagram or holding any of these sort of outlets accountable for the information that is heavily influencing communal dialogue across our country? Well, I, I think that what the panel is currently doing right now is is uh, is pretty responsible and is part of the action that we can take. Uh, we are very limited as to, I mean, you know, Facebook and, and Instagram, those are billion going into the trillion dollar companies, you know. So, you know, as far as trying to hold them accountable for misinformation or misrepresentation, that's that's way beyond our reach. But what we can do is like what many others uh, on the panel are doing, are, are putting out our own information uh, educating others on, on what they can do and how they can get involved and, and just trying to, uh, you know, bring solidarity between the Latin community, because even between us, there is a little bit of a disparity, you know, if you're from the Caribbean or if you're from Central and Latin America and, and so on, you know, we have to, we have to, uh, we have to abolish that because we're all the same people. And, and, you know, we just, we just landed in different places, but we're all the same community. So, uh, you know, bringing the solidarity, joining everybody together, uh, you know, because the, the dominant culture doesn't see any difference between us, you know, whether you're from the Caribbean or Latin America or anywhere else. So, uh, you know, everybody working together in solidarity, I think, is is also key uh, to to helping, you know, uh, steps go forward. Yeah, um, I guess I'll jump in and um, say a comment about that, too. Uh, I'm going to have to disagree a little bit with Walter there and, uh, and say that we do have to hold responsible the corporations and the major platforms that are basically letting misinformation spread. And it is, you know, through an algorithm. And so sometimes that could uh, make it difficult, right, to really target where that misinformation is coming. Um, but it is the response the social responsibility of these corporations, billion dollar corporations that have the resources, the money um, to make sure that there's no misinformation that's inciting violence, that's, um, that's you know, giving off rhetoric that is really just going to, mess with voting campaigns, right? Or um, as, we've, as we've seen, right, in the last year. Um, so that was just the comment I wanted to make. I think that as the people who are consuming, we hold a lot of power and sometimes that gets misdirected, but um, you know, we, we hold power as consumers and we can continue to hold um, you know, corporations and companies like Facebook, um, Twitter, Instagram accountable and we absolutely should. That is certainly the debate of the moment, right? Can can Facebook and the like police themselves, or well, I, listen, I, I, I would to, I don't I don't disagree with what Jamie's saying. I mean, when I said about holding them accountable, I mean, is um, how can we hold them? Because they're in the billions and they control everything that we see and hear, and they, they put everything out. So, I mean, if she if, you know if she's got a way to 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 hold them accountable, hey, I'm in, mm -hmm. I'm in. Sure. I right. mean, well, I mean, it sounds like we have multiple avenues forward and that maybe this is just the beginning of a campaign, because I do I do think that this conversation, not just in the context of immigration, but in the context of responsible information sharing is basically coming into the fore. And we'll have to sort of stay tuned to see whether this goes down a path more of regulation, whether it goes through some other avenue. But it does seem that the market will not correct necessarily this misinformation from being purveyed. But I agree, Walter, this is this is a problem that I, I don't know that there's a clear answer at this point. So um, I think we've only just begun the discussion of what even needs to be policed and, and if that's even possible. Um, all right, so I wanna turn now to another question. Um, this comes from someone who works closely with the immigrant community. And they say that in their experience, right, fear just even where the community comes together or there's programming, fear just continues to be um, something that limits people's access to local community resources. Um, to Amal's point, right, when we see uh, community policing take on immigration responsibilities, right, that erodes public faith and community policing. Because the question is, are you 
you know, policing against crime or are you out to get me as an immigrant, right? Um, and so I wonder if, uh, Imal, you could speak a little bit to sort of this culture of fear and then I'll hand it off to Erica um, also to reflect on her experiences um, in, that, in that realm as well. Yeah, you know, one thing that I mentioned earlier that, earlier that I'll reiterate is uh, disrupting the relationship between local law enforcement and federal immigration authorities. We have something in New Jersey called the Immigrant Trust Directive, which, um, which does just that. In most circumstances, law enforcement in New Jersey is not allowed to ask about immigration status. Um, there is no relationship between ICE and, and local law enforcement in most circumstances. Um, unless it's like particularly germane to um, the investigation at hand, which is very infrequent. Um, and so we think that that's, um, that that's a step in the right direction. We need to make sure that local law enforcement doesn't do that. And we're, we're working to try to codify that into law, uh, not just have an attorney general directive, but have legislation uh, that we hope to introduce sometime in the near future uh, called the Values Act, which will allow for um, which will prohibit local law enforcement from engaging in that kind of behavior um, as a matter of law. You know, uh, another thing that I think we need to do is have more people that look like us as our representatives, right? Um, we are, um, you know, we, we are going to be very soon a majority person of color uh, state in, in the country and, um, and our legislature and our local uh, town councils, et cetera, are, are, and certainly our police department um, or police force looks nothing like the communities that they represent. Um, and I'll, I'll say that, you know, I think we need to elect more people um, that are black and brown to every level, um, whether it's uh, local school boards or state le legislature, um, because we need to sort of allow for people with the same lived experiences, the people that bear that fear themselves um, to be in positions of power to have true meaningful change in the policies that govern us. Um, and, uh, and I think that is something that we can all play a part in, encouraging people to run for office. One of, the, one of the greatest barriers that I think we have in this country is the fact that people who aren't citizens of the United States can, it can, cannot uh, uh, run for most office, right? They can't run for most seats um, and people who aren't citizens can't vote. Um, I think that's a huge barrier and something that I hope that we in the near future can correct, um, at least for local elections. I've seen way too many school boards that look nothing like um, the children that go to schools in, in, in that community. Um, what, if you have the right to attend a public school, as you do, whether you're documented or not, you should have the right to dictate the policies that, um, that in, impact the children that go to those schools. Um, and, uh, and I think about my, my own mother who, who is not, uh, until, was not until recently a citizen of the United States. Um, uh, she sent three kids to public schools um, in uh, Lawrenceville, New Jersey, uh, but never was able to have a say in the way um, their kids were, her kids were educated. So um, that's something that I think is, is crucially important in, in the United States to make sure that we are, um, you know, we are uh, allowing people who have the same lived experiences as us to uh, govern us. Um, and I think that'll make a huge difference. The elected body should reflect the electorate, right? Exactly. Erica? Um, I just want to say, I think um, it's so important to create like a safe space for immigrant communities. That's, mm -hmm. that to me has been like the most transformation like transformative way to make people come to their own power and recognize, you know what, like I might be undocumented and I might not be able to vote, right? But I still have a say in the way that like my state looks like and the way that like the state's policies look like, right? Um, that's, that's how like our young people begin to talk about like, hey, you know what? Um, we should have access to occupational licenses, right? We did it with financial aid, but now let's move on to occupational licenses. Um, and it's making sure that we're creating a space where they feel safe 
um, talking about, you know what, I'm undocumented, right? And I, like, it's been really scary for me to say that for many years, like none of my teachers know it, right? But like, I know that you guys are undocumented and I wanna hear your story, right? And like, what work have you been working on, right? What's community organizing? How can I get involved, right? We're gonna go to Trenton next week um, and we're gonna like lobby. Um, how do you do that, right? And then like, let's talk about it. Let's like support each other, work with each other. Um, and then like right once you start giving folks these tools and this space to talk about their story um that's when the fear slowly starts to go away right um the people that you meet um once they start as a member or like a youth member of make the road new jersey they're timid they're shy right um they say you know like i'm illegal and they like hush it a little bit right um and then at the end or like fast forward to present time it's like I'm undocumented and I'm like unafraid and unapologetic about it um and like I I think that's the way that like most of the youth that I work with and like our members have come to um just being these like powerful movement leaders mm -hmm. well Erica just like your energy makes me feel like I want to go wherever you're going next so I will join you um, so we don't have much time left, so I just, I'll take this opportunity to just thank all of you for joining us, Walter, Yami, Amal, Erica, it's really been a pleasure uh, to join in this conversation with each of you this evening. At this point, I want to hand it back to Donna walker Kuhn um, from NJ NJPAC to just send us off for the evening and thank everyone for their presence. Thank you, Jason. This was an incredible, incredible and important and necessary dialogue. And we thank you from the bottom of our hearts for taking time out of your schedules uh, to share your perspectives, your experience and your action. Your advocacy is so important and inspiring and it shows us that everyone can do something. Each of you have shared from so many different platforms and perspectives, the action that you're taking. Uh, and we join you, we stand with you. So I'd like to thank our audience for staying with us. Uh, we had over 230 people uh, that stayed with us and really are interested. You can see from the chat that this was definitely a hot topic. So we'll probably revisit this again. There's so much more to say. So I invite everyone to join us next month. You know, our, our Standing in Solidarity Social Justice Series is monthly and it is a forever endeavor. It's not going away. Next month, our topic is spirituality in communities of color. And we will be speaking on this perspective from the African tradition, Native American, Indian, um, Christian. It will be quite, quite interesting. So I hope that you will join us for that. And of course, we're in the middle of jazz at NJ Pack. We have all kinds of wonderful, rich performances. So we invite you to come and play with us. Thank you so much, everyone. And we will see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Welcome. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you, NJPAC. Thanks so much.